Hello, everyone, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Crystal River. My name is Pastor Tim Lancey, and I want to thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning message. This morning, we're going to wrap up that series called Breaking Your Bad Habits Before They Break You. So far, we've talked about seven bad habits. Today, we're going to wrap it up by talking about the bad habit of prayerlessness. Now, prayerlessness is different from the other seven habits in that prayer is a good habit. The problem is, is that we pray too little. This morning, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, as Jesus teaches his disciples about prayer. And Jesus will leave us with this question. Why do you pray about so little when I am encouraging you to pray about so much? So if you have your Bible, grab it, open it to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and get ready to discover three lessons that will help you beat this habit of prayerlessness before this habit breaks you. Well, this morning I'm concluding the message series called Breaking Your Bad Habits Before They Break You. The purpose of this series has been to take a close look at eight bad habits that Christians tend to ignore. We tolerate these habits, we make excuses for these habits, and we slowly allow these habits to take over our life. So this series is a wake-up call to break those bad habits before they gain control of us. We've looked at seven bad habits. Lying, anger, excuses, worry, pride, guilt, and jealousy. Which of these seven bad habits give you the most trouble? Which one did you struggle with this past week? Which one keeps showing up week after week. Well, today we're going to conclude by looking at the eighth bad habit, and we call this habit prayerlessness or a lack of prayer. Now, this last habit is different from the previous seven habits in two ways. First, prayer is a good habit to develop, and the other habits are bad habits that we need to avoid. The problem is that we pray too little. Second, prayer is a habit that can help us defeat and break the other seven habits. If we prayed more, we wouldn't struggle so much with the other seven habits. Prayer is important for a Christian. Steve Poe puts it this way, prayer is like the air we breathe. It's our lifeline, our connection to God, and it sustains us spiritually. Without prayer, we'll find that our spiritual life will suffocate. Without prayer, we'll find it difficult to break any of those seven habits that are defeating us. So if prayer is that important, why do we struggle with it so much? If prayer is having a conversation with the God of the universe, then why isn't prayer the most important habit in our life? Prayer can be a struggle. You bow your head, you close your eyes, you say the words, Dear God or Dear Heavenly Father. Then you proceed to pour out your heart to God with every ounce of your being. You look up at the clock, and you've prayed for five minutes. What else can I say? How can I develop the habit of prayer when I run out of things to say after five minutes? You're not alone. We've all been there. Even Jesus' disciples had some questions about prayer. One day, the disciples heard Jesus praying. And when Jesus finished his prayer, the disciples looked at each other and thought, that was good. I wish I could pray like that. Then one of the disciples got the courage to say to Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus takes up that challenge 
to teach his disciples to pray. So what did Jesus say to his disciples about prayer? If you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray in Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Jesus is speaking. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. His disciples are listening, and this is what Jesus says, beginning in verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You may recognize those words as the Lord's Prayer. And before Jesus gives this prayer, he introduces it by saying, this then is how you should pray. Pray like this. Follow this pattern. And when you look at the sequence of the Lord's Prayer, there is a definite pattern or flow. It has a purposeful beginning, middle, and ending. So from this model prayer, Jesus wants us to understand three lessons about prayer. And these three lessons will challenge us with this question. Why do we pray so little when Jesus encourages us to pray so much? Let's take a look at those three lessons. Lesson number one, start with God. The Lord's Prayer begins with God, not with us. The prayer doesn't begin with the words, God, bless me, protect me, give me, and fix what's broken in my life. The prayer doesn't begin with our specific requests. The prayer begins with God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you pray, says Jesus, pause long enough to recognize who you're praying to. Start your prayer by recognizing the greatness of God. And when you pause long enough to think about and to consider how big God is, then all of those problems and concerns that are driving you to prayer begin to look differently. The longer you spend adoring, honoring, praising, and exalting God, the more confidence that you're going to have that God is able to handle whatever concerns you. Now, if we dissected and analyzed our prayers... I'm willing to guess that most of us don't start with God. We don't spend a lot of time praising and exalting our God. Most times we skip the praise and get right to the requests. Bless me, protect me, give me, fix what's broken. But when we begin our prayers with us, we're leaving out a critical part of prayer. We need to begin with God. Jesus tells us to stop and understand that we're praying to our Heavenly Father. We're speaking with the God who created the universe. Heavenly Father, great is your name. Great is your power. Great is your ability. I honor your name. I honor you. When we exalt God, it puts our problems and our issues into proper perspective. It reminds us that God is big enough to handle our relationship struggles, our emotional struggles, our financial struggles, and our health struggles. Start with God. Will you stay there a little while? Will you not rush through that? Start your prayers 
by focusing upon the greatness of God and not the urgency of your concerns. The longer you stay in praise, the more your soul realizes just how great God is. That will impact your prayer, and it will help you to find the way to break the bad habits that are plaguing your life. Start with God. Lesson number two, surrender to God. Now, once you start with the greatness of God, you're still not ready to hand God your grocery list of requests. It's still not time to start telling God all the great things that you want him to do for you. There's a middle step we often skip. And we skip this step because it's so hard. Jesus tells us to surrender to God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's difficult to surrender to God because something inside of me wants to pray, my kingdom come, my will be done. I want what I want when I want it. And the reason I pray is to get God to do things my way. Yet Jesus instructs us to surrender our will to God's will. Jesus teaches us to say to God, before I even get to my needs, my wants, and my wishes, I just want you to know that whatever your answer is, your kingdom before my kingdom, your will before my will, I'm surrendering all of me to all of you. Your agenda before my health, for my health, comes before my agenda for my health. Your agenda for my money comes before my agenda for my money. Your agenda for my career comes before my agenda for my career. I surrender to you. Your kingdom, not mine. Your will, not mine. And about this time, you may be thinking, I don't want to do that. You know, can I just skip this step and move on to bless me, protect me, give me, and fix what's broken? And Jesus' answer is no. Because if you skip this step, you miss the point of prayer. The point of prayer isn't to get stuff from God. The point of prayer is to bring your will into alignment with God's will. The point is to bring your agenda into alignment with God's agenda. So Jesus is saying to us, before you decide to move on and start asking for things, don't do that until your life is 100% surrendered to God. When you surrender your will to God's will, your life begins to change. Prayer is no longer a ritual. It's a personal relationship with your heavenly Father. Prayerlessness gets replaced with powerful prayer because now you're bringing everything to God to discover His will for your life. Prayer is no longer a religious function. It's an opportunity for you to connect your life with your heavenly Father who loves you and cares about you. Have you reached the point where you've surrendered your will to your heavenly Father's will? Lesson number three, seek supply from God. Now, once you start with God, and once you've surrendered your life to God, you're in the perfect position to say to him, God, bless me, protect me, give me, and fix what's broken in my life. You're in the right place spiritually to seek God for all the good things you want him to do for you and for all the things that you want him to supply for you. And Jesus instructs us to seek God to supply three things. First, seek God for provisions. 
Jesus tells us to pray, give us today our daily bread. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing unspiritual about praying for our most basic needs. Our daily bread. Our only fault is that we try to get there too soon. You see, most of our prayers begin and end with our needs. But the Lord's Prayer teaches us that our needs to be are to be offered to God within the context of God's greatness and God's will. Requests for our physical needs and material needs are often the only subjects of our prayer. We forget about everything else except our most pressing needs. When we share prayer requests with other Christians, we create grocery lists of things that we share with God, including our surgeries, our aches, our pains, our financial struggles, and all kinds of other special needs. Now, there's nothing wrong with bringing all of those things before God. The point is that the Lord's Prayer invites us to bring those requests within the context of our surrender to God. God provides what you need. Whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, it all comes from God. The Bible says in James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Seek God for all your provisions. So think about it. What are the three biggest needs in your life right now? Are you praying about those needs? Are you seeking God's will and plan about those needs? Are you trusting God to meet those needs? Second, seek God for pardon. Jesus tells us to pray, forgive us our debts, even as we also have forgiven our debtors. As followers of Jesus Christ, we still mess up, we still drop the ball, we still sin, and we come short of God's expectations. So what should we do when we fail? Should we hide it? Should we pretend that it never happened? Should we simply skip church the next week? No. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we confess our sins, when we admit them, God forgives us and restores us to harmony. The Bible tells us to confess our sins. The word confess means to admit. It means to name it. Now, many times we confess our sins by saying, God, please forgive all of my sins. But that's not confession. Confession means that we name our failures before God. We confess our sins by naming our sins to God by agreeing with God that what we did was wrong, and by asking God for His cleansing. Is there a sin in your life that you need to confess? When you confess, you experience pardon. Third, seek God for protection. Jesus tells us to pray, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. From the evil one. Temptation is something that we're good at finding on our own. You know, we just seem naturally inclined to lead ourselves into temptation. So we need to pray, God, protect me from sin. Protect me from evil. Protect me from myself. Protect my family. Protect my marriage. Billy Graham writes these words, We're to pray in times of adversity, lest we become faithless and unbelieving. We're to pray in times of prosperity, 
lest we become boastful and proud. We're to pray in times of danger, lest we become fearful and doubting. We're to pray in times of security, lest we become self-sufficient. Satan can use any situation, both good and bad, to lead us away from God. So in every circumstance, we need to ask God to show us the way out of temptation. We must trust God's protection from the temptation to give in to all of those bad habits that want to destroy us. The Bible puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to people. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Is there a bad habit or addiction that's driving you crazy, that's making your life miserable? Seek God's protection. Jesus invites you in the Lord's Prayer to bring every concern and every need to your heavenly Father. Talk with God and pray about everything. Yet many Christians have a bad habit of praying about so little when Jesus encourages them to pray about so much. If you want prayer to be a regular habit in your life, then you need to daily practice praying. Schedule a few minutes every day to have a conversation with your Heavenly Father. An old preacher named F.B. Meyer put it this way, the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. I read a story about a pastor who asked his church to pray that God would shut down the neighborhood bar. And the whole church met together for a prayer meeting, asking God to rid the neighborhood of that terrible bar. A few weeks later, Lightning struck the bar and burned it to the ground. The owner of the bar heard about the church prayer meeting and decided to bring a lawsuit against the church. He argued in court that God struck down his bar with lightning because those church people met and prayed. Well, the pastor admitted in church that yes, they did have a prayer meeting for that very purpose, but no one in the congregation really expected anything to happen. The judge leaned back and said, I can't believe what I'm hearing. I have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer (laughs) in a church that does not believe. Well, I don't know if that story actually happened or not, but I do know this. There is great power when God's people pray. To break the habit of prayerlessness, you must admit that you have a problem. Own it, acknowledge it, admit it, and then break that habit by bringing everything to God in prayer. Start your prayer with God. Surrender everything to God. And then, seek God to supply everything that you need. Why do you pray about so little when Jesus encourages you to pray about so much? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these incredible words from Jesus that we call the Lord's Prayer. They teach us so much about how to develop a prayer life that's powerful. Father, help us to do a better job of starting with you, spending time just thinking about who you are. And as one of our church members would say to me often, what a privilege it is 
that we can bring everything in our life and have a conversation with the creator of the universe. Wow. And Father, help us to surrender to you. Prayer is not a wrestling match to try to get you to do things our way. Prayer is about bringing our life into alignment with your will. And then, Father, you do invite us to bring everything to you. Once we start with you and surrender to you, we can bring everything to you. We can truly say, God, bless me. Protect me from evil. Give me my daily bread. Fix and forgive all those things that are broken in my life. Father, may it not be said of us that we practice prayerlessness. May it be said of us individually and as a church family that we are people of prayer, that prayer is the lifeline, the lifeblood of our church. Father, teach us to be people of prayer. When Jesus walked this earth, he was a man of prayer. May it be true of us, his followers, that we are men and women of prayer. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.